All hail to the Christ within. This is your obedient servant, Reverend George Latimer Knight. Thank you and praising you for your love and support of this ministry. I praise God for fatherhurley.com coming up on 18 years of ministry and the Light of Prophecy Ministries. Now, for the next two videos, we're going to celebrate something special. This is the most wonderful time of the year. And I want to wish everyone a glorious Hurley's Feast and an everlasting dawn of progression. I want to honor Father George William Hurley as we celebrate his birth. When he founded the Universal Hager Spiritual Church, September 23rd, 1923, he came preaching peace, joy, and happiness to all those who will believe in Christ within. And over the early years, the Spirit revealed to him that instead of uh, focusing on Christmas and celebrating uh, December 25th, as the birth of Jesus, knowing that that was not his actual birthday, the Spirit impressed upon him to celebrate his birth. And he was born on Sunday, February the 17th, 1884, at 7 a.m. Amen. And we celebrate his birth. And we call it Glorious Hurley's Feast. And then on uh, February 24th, we celebrate what we call an everlasting dawn of progression, which is like our spiritual new year. So uh, we're going to talk about um, the revelation of the seven golden feast steps. And this, uh, these lessons are drawn from the Aquarian Gospel of Jesus Christ, chapters 47 through 55. And you can find the Aquarian Gospel on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, any uh, bookstore, and is available for free online. Just have to search for it. You can find a free copy so that you can read along with us as we study. Now, uh, unfortunately, at least this year, uh, time will not permit me to do a separate video on each step. It will be the Lord's will on next year. We will... We'll start planning now to do just that for next year. But this year, we're going to split this into two videos. And we're going to talk about, in broadcast six, we're going to talk about steps one through four, which are sincerity, justice, faith, and philanthropy. And then in broadcast seven, we'll do part two. And we'll talk about uh, the last steps, five, six, and seven, which are heroism. Love divine and the Christ. So before we um, dive into the steps, join me in singing the chorus of the song Glorious Early's Feast, written by our very own late great Professor Herbert Moore of Detroit, Michigan. Glorious, glorious, glorious Hurley's feast. He gave us joy and peace that brought us sweet relief. Oh, glorious, glorious, glorious Hurley's feast. We praise his holy name. So we sing glorious, glorious, glorious Hurley's feast. He gave us joy and peace, oh, that brought us sweet relief. Oh, glorious, glorious, glorious Hurley's feast, we praise his holy name. Amen. God bless you. Now let us go into the seven golden feast steps. All right, welcome to part one of our uh, two-part session on 
the seven golden feast steps. And as we said in the introduction, we're coming from the Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ, uh, chapters 47 through 55. And just for a point of reference, that is section 11, Life and Works of Jesus in Egypt. So we're going to go to chapter 47. Uh, before we get started, as I said, we're going to kind of just do like a, a quick run through of each chapter, of each step. We're not going to deal with each chapter in its totality. We'll do that uh, next year. Amen. So let's go to chapter 47, and that's the introduction uh, to this uh, study. And it opens with Jesus' uh, visits with Elihu and Salom in Egypt. And these were his instructors. Um, they taught him and John, uh, his cousin John, which many will know as John the Baptist, but Father Hurley referred to him as John the Harbinger or the forerunner of the Christ. Elihu and Salome, they were their instructors and Jesus went back to visit with them to tell them of all his journeys thus far in his life. And they were so proud and happy to hear of his successes and to see that their instruction was not in vain. And then we hear in verse 9, um, he goes to Heliopolis for instruction. And it says, chapter 47, the Quran Gospel, verse 9, And Jesus stayed in Zoan many days, and then went forth unto the city of the sun, that men called Heliopolis, and sought admission to the temple of the sacred brotherhood. Oh, uh, he went there, went before the council, and Jesus explains to them why he's there in verses 12 and 13. And Jesus said, in every way of earth life, I would walk in every hall of learning. I would sit the heights that any man has gained, these I would gain. What any man has suffered, I would meet, that I may know the griefs the disappointments and the sore temptations of my brother man, that I may know just how to succor those in need. In other words, how to help those in need. How can I really help you if I've never been through anything myself? Now, all of us who preach the word or share the word, you may not have the title reverend, elder, bishop, whatever, but anyone who shares the word of God, anyone who shares the word of grace and truth, with anyone else, it is your job to uplift those in need. But we can't help those in need if we've never been in need. But it doesn't matter what status you were born in, how much money you have or don't have, education and so forth. We've all had a need. We've all been through something. So we all don't have to be ex-drug dealers or ex-prostitutes uh, or uh, ex-alcoholics or what have you. They're, they're, but we've all been through something. And the main thing is that we have to be uh, real with ourselves that we have been through something, that we've had trials and tribulations, that we're not going to be judgmental. Now, we can really get with people and let them know if they're going the wrong path, that they need to change. But we don't have to be judgmental. But we are humble because we know we've been through something ourselves. Uh, and this is the preparation that uh, he was given. Verses 16 and 17, again, the master spoke. He said, and this, when we say it's here, the master is referring to the head of the temple. So the, again, the master spoke. He said, the greatest heights are gained by those who reach the greatest depths. And you shall reach the greatest depths. The guide then led the way, and in the fountain Jesus bathed. But when he had been clothed in proper garb, he stood again before the Hierophant. And the Hierophant, that's the name of the leader of this temple. Amen. That concludes chapter 47. Now let's go to chapter 48. 
and talk about the first golden fee step, sincerity. Got to be sincere. We have to be real about what we're doing. You will never reach the heights of mastery. You will never truly be a spiritual minded person unless you are sincere. That's the first thing you got to be. You got to be real with yourself. You got to be able to look at the man or woman in the mirror and be honest and true to you. If you can be honest and true to that man or woman in the mirror, you can be honest and true to any other human being on earth. Chapter 48, it says, Jesus receives from the Hierophant his mystical name and number, passes the first brotherhood test, and receives his first degree, sincerity. Uh, and Jesus was given the name, the Logos Circle 7. The Logos Circle 7. And that's in uh, verses 1 through 5. Now, verse 6, uh, we have the setup of the first test. The master said, the Logos will give heed to what I say. No man can enter into light till he has found himself. Go forth and search till you have found your soul and then return. Amen. So this is what he's on the path of. No man can enter into light till he has found himself. You got to know who you are. You got to know who you are. You got to be familiar with yourself if you ever intend to truly find the light. Because, see, we, again, we all have flaws. We all have issues. And if we don't deal with our issues or we're not even aware of our issues, we will never truly have the light. Why? Because every time you take a step, when that resistance, that negative force comes against you, it's going to get you in your weak areas. It's going to attack you in your weak areas. So then if you have no idea, no, at least in your conscious mind, what your some of your weak areas are, you won't know what to guard against. Like I said, some people are alcoholics. So you're going to have to guard against stress and worry. Uh, as some of you know, I, I drive for ride sharing. And I've been doing that um uh, this year will be three years I've been doing that. And just last night, I had two ladies. It was a, a woman, I think in her 50s, late 50s, and a young woman in her 20s. And they were here in Chicago for uh, some type of uh, alcoholic uh, uh, anonymous retreat. And they were going they're going to be in town six weeks. And they were talking to each other about their issues. And the older, one, older woman said, that she's thankful for this program because she's starting to learn coping mechanisms. And she said that she had been uh, sober for 37 days, praise God. And the young woman said she had been sober for 12 days. But you see, the, the, the alcohol wasn't the issue. That's not the issue, drinking. As they both stated, they have coping issues. They don't know how to deal with stress. They, they don't know how to, how to deal with the pressures of life. So the alcohol is their outlet. So again, you can never truly find a light until you have dealt with self. Now, can these two ladies find the light? Sure they can. Why? Because now they are aware that it's not the alcohol that's really the problem. They're probably going to have to uh, abstain from that. But it's the reasons that push them to the alcohol. Because they don't know how to cope with the pressures of life. And as they learn how to do that, then the alcohol won't be as much of an issue. That's how you find the light, by knowing who you are. All right, let's keep moving here. So Jesus uh, was put in a room, and he studied for days alone. Then a priest came to visit him. And the priest... Uh, tried to convince him to leave the place, to leave the temple, that 
these uh, priests there at the temple were deceiving him and that they were going to do him in and that he should uh, go with him because he knew a way out of the temple. And Jesus refused the deceit. He refused to give in to this uh, supposed priest. He decided that he would stay at the temple and he would uh, follow the steps. He would go through the trials so that he could become who he needed to become. And it says in verses 22 and 23 that Jesus receives the first degree. And all the brothers stood, the hierophant came forth and laid his hand on Jesus' head and placed within his hands a scroll on which was written just one word, sincerity. The God again appeared and led the way in a spacious room replete with everything a student craves with Jesus bade to rest and wait. He overcame deceit. You sincere, you won't be deceitful. To others or to yourself, you will do the right thing. Amen. That concludes our study of uh, sincerity. Now we're going to All right, now we're going on to our second step, which is justice. That's chapter 49. Jesus passes the second brotherhood test and receives the second degree justice. Jesus is led to a dark room. He remained in solitude for a few days. And one night, a secret door opened. And this is what it says in verse 4, chapter 49. And Jesus slept. And in the dead of night, a secret door was opened. And in priest attire, two men came in. Each carried in his hand a little flickering lamp. Keep that in mind. A little flickering lamp. Oh, my, my, my. See, <laughs> sometimes we're on the path of right. We're seeking the light. We want better for ourselves. And here come people with a little bit of light. Here they come trying to deceive us with a little bit of something. I don't want a little bit of something. I have a bigger goal in mind. I don't want to rehearse uh, our four uh, broadcasts on goals and vision and so forth. But this is a good example of that. I use myself as, a, as an example. I have some big goals. I have some uh, heavy visions that God has given me. And I'm one who's willing to participate in the long game. So sometimes people that know me will look at me on the outside and think, I, whatever they think. Some people think I don't have anything. I got more than what you think. But I'm willing to sacrifice presently to have a future goal. Jesus wanted to reach the Christhood. Jesus wanted the light. He wanted to experience the light for himself. And here come these two men dressed in priest attire. This is another theme. That we're going to see in every test. Here come these men. They look like they got something. They look the part. But they're not right. They have a little flickering lamp. These two little flickering lamps. Well I'd rather stay in the dark a little while longer. And receive the full light of God. <coughs> than to just follow some carnal minded men. With a little light leading me nowhere fast. <clears throat> they told Jesus that there was not, that this was not the place for them or for him. They said they know of all the secret passageways. But Jesus was not persuaded by their words and 
he just missed them. And this uh, see how he did that verses nineteen <clears throat> to twenty two. Nay, men, by whatsoever way you came, return. My soul prefers the darkness of the grave to little flickering lights like these you bring. My conscience rules what these my brothers have to say. I'll hear. And when the testimony all is in, I will decide. You cannot judge for me, nor I for you. Let's stop there. That's verse 20. Let's stop there. <clears throat> hear what he said. I want to hear them out. I'm going to go through this process. Then I will decide. Then I will decide whether this is right or wrong. Sometimes you have to just go through some things. And then decide for yourself whether it's right or wrong. <clears throat> there are many of beautiful relationships, romantic relationships, beautiful marriages that have been broken up by folk on the outside interfering. Sometimes you're just going to have to get on in the relationship and decide for yourself. Now, uh, please don't, don't write me or call me or email me with some foolishness. Not sure if you're getting beat up or you're getting abused or so forth. Please get the hell out of there today. Get up out of there. But if it's if it's just an average normal relationship and you having just you know run of the mill issues, you may just have to stay in there a little while and just see where it goes. Don't let others judge for you. You can listen to what they have to say, but then you're going to have to be the arbiter of that decision. Verse 21, be gone, you men, be gone, and leave me to this charming light. For while the sun shines not, within my soul there is a light surpassing that of sun or moon. It may be dark in this room right now. The songwriter said, if the storms keep on raging in my life, hallelujah, shot. Uh, it may be dark in my life right now, but it's all right because I'm on my way. Praise the Lord. I'm on my way. <clears throat> There's a light in me that will lighten up all this darkness. So I don't need your little flickering light. You carnal minded men, you men dressed in priest garbs trying to fool me. I am just because I'm going to give the temple a chance and then I will decide for myself. Praise God. Verse 22, then with an angry threat that they would do him harm, the wily tempters left and Jesus was again alone. <laughs> Jesus receives a second degree. Verses 23 to 25, again the white robed priest appeared and led the way and Jesus stood again before the hierophants. <clears throat> and not a word was said, but in his hands, the master placed a scroll on which the word suggestive justice was inscribed. And Jesus was the master of the phantom forms of prejudice and of treachery. Oh, oh, oh. America needs to overcome prejudice and treachery. Woo, what you say? America needs this lesson today. That concludes our lesson on justice. And let's move on now to the next step. We're going higher and higher. In the name of the Lord. Praise God, my dears. Now we're going on to the third step, which is faith. Drawn from chapter 50 of the Aquarian Gospel. Still dealing with the seven golden feast steps. And I hope you're seeing why Father Hurley uh, chose this and why the Spirit gave it to him. Because it is a wonderful study, isn't it? It's a beautiful study that we can all learn and grow from. Amen. Let's go now to chapter 50. Jesus passes the third brotherhood test and receives the third degree faith. Jesus is taken to a room trimmed with gold and silver, furnished with the finest of everything. As he studied, a priest appeared. This priest told him he should leave the temple, start his own school of thought, and enjoy his own fame. Now you see, these first three tests have a similarities, which P 
people come in dressed as priests, and they all try to get him to leave. But here in this third step, this step of faith, this priest is saying, leave the temple, but don't just leave the temple and give up on the process. That's what the first two tests were basically about, giving up on the process. But see, in this step, he's saying, leave the temple, start your own thing, and you can be famous. And you can, because he was already known already. He'd already done some works already. Say, go be famous. Build on your own fame and you can have your own school and you can be famous in your own right. <laughs> ah. And he calls with these words in verse 11 of chapter 50. I would advise you to renounce uncertain things and choose the course that leads to certain fame. Oh, many men and women of the gospel have chosen this path. Many uh, politicians who started off with good intentions follow this path. They renounced things that were uncertain and chose the course that led to certain fame. They chose fame and fortune over their sincere desire to do good. They chose fame and fortune over their desire to mete out justice to society where everyone will be treated fairly and equally. Now, how did Jesus respond to this? You might be surprised at how he responded. Um, verses 12 to 14. And thus the priest, a demon in disguise, sung siren songs of unbelief. And Jesus meditated long and well on what he said. The conflict was a bitter one. For king ambition is a sturdy foe to fight. For 40 days the higher wrestled with the lower self. And then the fight was won. Oh, he wrestled with that one. Why did he wrestle? Because, see, uh, Jesus knew. He knew himself. He knew he had gifts. He remember in the scripture when he was 12 years old, his parents had left uh, the city and he stayed behind at the temple. And it, after several days on the journey, they thought he was in the caravan. Remember, they didn't have cars and trucks and vans, so it wasn't like they were all in the same minivan. They thought he was in another uh, carriage or down back in, in the uh, caravan. And when they realized he wasn't there, they all had to turn around and go back. And when they went back, they found Jesus, that 12-year-old Jesus in the temple, uh, debating with the priest and the scholars in the temple. And asked his mother, said, what, we, what are you thinking, boy? What were you doing? You have to stay with us. We're your parents. And Jesus said, I have to get about my father's business. 12 years old. And he was debating with the priests and scholars. The greatest scholars and priests uh, of Judaism in Jerusalem. He was intelligent. He was anointed. He was gifted. So now here he has, here is now here he is as an adult, and now he's being tempted. You are gifted. You are strong. You are powerful. You have wisdom. You are somebody special. You don't have to go through the process. Come out the process. Do your own thing. Woo! Do your own thing. But Jesus, his higher self and his lower self, they wrestled for 40 days, but the higher one out. That's what we got to do. You may be gifted. You may be anointed, but you got to go through the process. I thank God for the Universal Hager Spiritual Church. Praise the Lord. I thank God for this great organization that I was born into, raised up in, and have been a part of all my life. I thank God because I learned the process. And people have told me many good things about who I am, my talents and my gifts. And I thank God for all those uh, prophecies and, and messages and readings and so forth. But I thank God for the process of unfoldment, for the process of development. Uh, so he fought, he wrestled, and he won the fight. 
we're going to skip down to verses 20 to 22. And this is Jesus closing over the faith. Give me the poverty of men, the consciousness of duty done in love, the approbation of my God, and I will be content. Now, he didn't mean that I got, you have to be poor to serve God. But he's saying, but I don't need any specific material thing to serve God. If I never get the BMW, if I never get the, uh, the Phantom, if I never get the Cadillac, whatever it is you want, will you stop serving God because you don't get some one material thing? Will you stop serving God because you don't get a $5,000 suit? Woo! I feel the spirit of Reverend John B. Lewis Jr. Welcome, kind spirit. He would preach sometime and say, uh, some of you want a $1,000 suit, but you won't put $5 into the kingdom. You won't even give a dollar to a homeless man on the corner, but you want a $1,000 suit. <laughs> so I'll get $1,000 suits. And then go on in the name of the Lord. Welcome, kind spirit. Oh, glory. I'm getting filled up now. Verse uh, 21, 22. And then he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, My Father God, I thank thee for this hour. I ask not for the glory of thyself. I fain would be a keeper of thy temple gates. And serve my brother man. He was echoing David. Who said I'd uh, rather be the doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. Than to be the greatest of the unrighteous. I'd rather be put in a subservient position in the kingdom of God. Than to serve the world. Why? Because wherever I am in the kingdom. Even if I'm on the lowest rung. If I'm in the kingdom of God, I have the light. I'm on top. That's what folks don't understand. When you're in the kingdom, you're on top. No matter what so-called level you may be on, you are always on the top. God, hallelujah. Mm. And let's uh, see here. Jesus received the third degree. Verses 23 and 24. Again was Jesus called to stand before the Hierophant. Again no word was said. But in his hands the master placed a scroll on which was written faith. And Jesus bowed his head in humble thanks. Then went his way. Thus closes our lesson on faith. The third step. Now let's go on a little bit higher to the fourth step. Amen. Praise God. Now we're on to the fourth step in our study of the golden feast steps, seven golden feast steps. Step number four is philanthropy, drawn from chapter 51 of the Aquarian Gospel. And here, Jesus was led now to what is called the Hall of Mirth, another beautiful room. Men and women dressed in fine clothes. We're having a party. And Jesus didn't get involved in what they were doing. He was just observing them. And let's see what the temptation was here in verses 4 to 9. Another priest. So let's see. First three uh, tests he did. They were priests. People were dressed as priests. Let's see what goes on here. Again, this is chapter 51. Uh, where it says, Jesus passed the fourth brotherhood test. And receives the fourth degree philanthropy. Uh, that's again verses four to nine. And Jesus watched the happy throng in silence for a time. And then a man in garb of sage came up and said, Most happy is the man who like to be, can gather sweets from every flower. <laughs> so here, see now the deception is moving a little higher. The first three tests were sincerity justice and faith. 
you had men dressed as priests. Now we have someone dressed as a sage, a wise man, spouting things that do sound wise a little bit. The most happy is a man who like to be can gather sweets from every flower. Now we can think of this in a material, a sexual manner. You have men who just sleep around all different types of women or men or whatever their proclivity is because they want to get the sweets from every flower. You have women who are the same way, sleep around with different men, women, or whatever their proclivity is. Why? Because they want the sweets from every flower. They can't be content and satisfied with one. They got to hop around. Some people is not sex. It's, it's, uh, Looking for a good time. Go to the casino one day, run out uh, across town the other next day, and they're just chasing uh, feelings. But there's no uh, direction. There's no vision behind it. They're just hopping around doing stuff. Now, there's nothing wrong with someone who wants to travel the world or some so forth. But see, in that case, it's not aimless. They do have a goal. They do have a, a, a right thought. They want to well, no, I'm going to take a year and I'm going to travel the world. So they may be bouncing around, but they're not trying to get the sweets from every flower. They want to have a genuine experience of the world. And there's nothing wrong with that. But this is not what this supposed sage is talking about. Verse 5, the wise man is the one who seeks for pleasure and can find it everywhere. At best, verse 6, at best, man's span of life on earth is short and then he dies and goes he knows not where. This is the lore of the carnal mind. This is the lore of the lore of self. Look, life is short. Have a good old time. Just, just do you. Now, you can do you in a righteous way. But if you do it in a selfish way, it's no good. Seeking for pleasure. Because see, if you're a pleasure seeker, See, after a while, you're going to do all kind of perverted things. And most times we think of perversion as sexual in nature. Now, I mean that too. But there are all kinds of perversion. You have children and you out there having a good time in the street partying and not caring for your children. Not doing what you can for them. That's no good. Young lady that I know, known for some time, she's doing that. Her uh, parents are raising her uh, her children. I won't say how many because I don't want to give it away at all. Uh, her parents are taking care of her children right now. But there's nothing wrong with her. She's not on drugs. She's not uh, alcoholic. She's just seeking pleasure. She wants to enjoy her life. She wants to live her life. Well, there's nothing wrong with wanting to live your life and enjoying yourself. And I mean, heck, if your parents can raise your children for you, and been doing so for a few months now. Surely they wouldn't mind watching them, you know, on some evenings while you go out and enjoy yourself. But she just, yeah, you take the, these children, these that I have given birth to. You take them, mother and father. You take them because I want to have pleasure. I want to enjoy myself. That selfishness. Because one day those children are going to have some issues behind their mother, leaving them behind. Oh, Father, right now, even in the midst of this video, I'm praying for that young lady. You know who I'm talking about, Father. And all those men and women in that same category. Touch these men and women, my Father. Touch them right now. And help them be the parents that their children need. I create to be so right now. Amen, amen, amen. Woo, I feel all right. You all excuse me. <laughs> I'm a spiritualist. Amen. Hallelujah. If you know somebody who needed that prayer, share this video with them. Ooh, ah, I feel the Holy Ghost now. We're almost done uh, with this part one of our feet steps. Uh, phew, uh, <laughs> ooh, I don't know what I'm doing now. My, my, my. Thank you, kind spirit. That situation's changing. And all these other men and women who are out here seeking for pleasure and not doing what they need to do. Go back to school. huh? Get that training. Reconcile with the children. 
reconcile with your parents. Reconcile with whoever you need to reconcile with. If you owe somebody an apology, apologize to them. If you can make it right, make it right. Do whatever you have to do to do the right thing. Uh, verses 7, 8, and 9. Then let us eat and drink and dance and sing and get the joys of life. For death comes apace, comes on apace. It is but foolishness to spend a life for other men. Behold, all die and lie together in the grave where none can know and none can show forth gratitude. But Jesus answered not. Upon the tents of guests and all their rounds of myrrh, he gazed in silent thought. Get out there and enjoy your life. Just do your thing. The song said, it's your thing. Do what you want to do. I can't tell you who to talk to. Go on and do your thing. <laughs> That's the wisdom from the supposed sage. Jesus didn't answer. He just sat in silent thought. Watched in silent thought. Jesus then saw a man, an elderly woman, and a little child in need. The pleasure seekers, how it says in verse 15, the party goers, encouraged Jesus to join in the party. They said, come on, join in. You know, come on, you know, get you a drink. Come on and you know, have a good time with us. And Jesus responds, and we're going to read a couple portions of his response. Verses 16 to 18, then verses 21 to 24. Verse 16, starting, How could I seek for pleasure for myself while others I want? How can you think that while the children cry for bread, while those in haunts of sin call out for sympathy and love that I can fill myself to full with the good things of life? I tell you, nay, we all are kin, each one a part of the great human heart. I cannot see myself apart from the poor man that you so scorn and crowded to the wall. We'll stop there. We're all, this is, well, this is essentially Jesus' argument. We are all a part of each other. Like you said, I love that, that phrase. We're all a part of the human heart. We're, we're all one. We're all one. We're one body. We're all human. We're all God's creation. Sula basa. We're all a part of this great vast universe, this great planet. We're all a part of each other. And while there's nothing wrong with pleasure, in and of itself. The seeking of pleasure alone is selfish and it butts against the love and the, the care that people need. That man, that elderly woman, and that little child, they needed help. But the, the, the pleasure seekers were so busy having a good time, they scorned them and they ignored them. We could do the same thing. We have to learn how to love and support each other. And sometimes that means I may miss out on some pleasures right now. To have the, the bigger goal, the bigger pleasure of knowing that the world is a better place because I live. Praise the Lord. Verses 21 to 24. I tell you men, what you have done to thee, my country, you have done to me. You have insulted me in your own home. I cannot stay. I will go forth and find that child, that woman, and that man and give them help until my life's blood all has ebbed away. Woo, Lord. I call it pleasure when I help the helpless, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, heal the sick, and speak good words of cheer to those unloved, discouraged, and depressed. And this is that you call myrrh is but a phantom of the night with flashes of the flyer passion painting pictures on the wall of time. This is nothing. Again, I, I'm, this is me talking. 
There's nothing wrong with pleasure in and of itself. But seeking pleasure to the point where you got to put others down, that's no good. Glory, that is not godly. That is not right. That is not good. Praise the holy name. Oh, shot God. It's no good. You feeling good and everybody else is feeling bad at your expense? Hell no. Do the right thing. Jesus receives a fourth degree philanthropy. Verses 25 to 20, uh, 27. And while the Lovo spoke, the white robe priest came in and said to him, The council waits for you. Then Jesus stood again before the bar. Again, no word was said. The hierophant placed in his hands a scroll on which was written, Philanthropy. And Jesus was a victor over selfish self. Again, nothing wrong with one of the nice things. Nothing wrong with wanting a car, a house, a certain type of car, a certain type of house. Uh, you may want a Bentley. I used to say when I was growing up, I wanted a Bentley. And maybe I'll still get one one day. But not at the expense of my wife and children. Not at the expense of trying to do some good for the fall of humanity. We have to be philanthropists. We have to be giving. You can still have some good things. You can still you know, do whatever materially you want and to do. You can have whatever material things you want to have. See, actually, selfishness is a spirit of lack. Let me close with this. That is a spirit of lack. Think about it. If I really believe in God, if I am truly in the light of God, if I am truly unfolding my innate forces, if I'm a truly a master of self, if I'm truly taking in the word of God, remember the secret is in John 15, verse 7. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. It's a spirit of lack. If you think, well, I can't, uh, for example, I can't give to the church and pay my car note. You're in lack. Because if you can have what you will, then I can say that prayer and I can hold a thought. Lord, kind spirit, help me to see the way in which I can give to the to the, the causes, the church, uh, the, the Red Cross or, or the African American Museum or whatever you want to give to. Father, open my understanding so that I can give to the causes I want to give to. I can help young people. I can start whatever programs I want to start and support, whatever programs I think are good. And I can still have the nice clothes and still have whatever jewelry I want, whatever kind of car I want. You can have it all in the name of the Lord. If you're selfish, that's a spirit of lack. Look at Bill Gates. He's still a billionaire. He's given many tens of hundreds of millions of dollars away in various philanthropic activities. But guess what? He's still a multi-billionaire. Warren Buffett has given hundreds of millions of dollars to philanthropic activities. But guess what? He's still a multi-billionaire. You can just use those two men as an example. You can have material and still be able to give away. Because if you really understand the, the word of God, as you give, it's going to come back. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, when men give liberally into your bosom. God bless you. Thus closes our, our lesson on philanthropy. Let's go up a little bit higher. In part two, we're going to deal with heroism, uh, love divine, and the Christ. God bless you. Thank you for joining us for our early speech videos. We're so glad that you came by and I hope that all my fellow uh, earlyites will uh, watch these videos and enjoy them. And those of you who are not a part of Father Hurley's uh, doctrine. I hope that you receive something out of uh, these seven steps. Uh, you can visit us online at www.fatherhurley.com. 
Uh, you can visit us on Facebook on our Facebook page is under my name, George Hubert Latimer Knight. Uh, we also uh, on Twitter at GHL Knight. That's G H L K N I G H T. Uh, of course, we have this YouTube channel. Uh, youtube.com slash father hurley so just join us get in touch with us if you want to write me personally a letter or send a card uh, my address is p.o box 43363 chicago illinois 60643 so i thank you again and i hope you have enjoyed your hurley speaks I hope you're having a good time. Celebrate and be glad. And just know that whatever you desire, it is yours today if you believe. If God is giving you the vision, if God is giving you the thought, hold on to that. Trust that spirit within and move forward in that. And you will be blessed. And after we're done with these feast step videos, then we're going to have uh, at least one, maybe two, on the dawn of everlasting dawn of progression. And then we'll move on to some other uh, subjects. May peace and love abide with you one and all.